make the clicking sound with their tongue. They just go and astonishingly, because it is a consistent sound, you know what it should sound like, I able by being able to interpret how it is filtered and echoed through a space, you can get a really, really good sense of space. And uh, I've had it demonstrated to me by a blind person where uh, uh, they're doing an interview um, online with uh, with a, a camera uh, for a television show. And uh, they would echolocate. Not only could they point out where the camera is, where the lens is, but they could point out where the boom microphone is that's hanging overhead from them. So it is not very specificity. And it does seem that you know, it, he wasn't 100% dependent on the king. He could even do it while riding a horse. And by that would be, you know, hearing the sounds of the, of the horse's hooves. And uh, he was able to ride a, a horse uh, completely w- without being guided. And there's an account of somebody, uh, a journalist in Tasmania, who was watching him uh, ride, a, uh, ride a, a horse down the street in Tasmania, in, you know, this is the 1830s, 1840s, and uh, in company with two other horsemen, and they they turn a corner, and he turns a corner at exactly the same time, and, and doesn't miss anything. So, once again, he didn't have a name for it, and didn't even have an inclination for naming it. But there is no explanation other than him having independently discovered the exact same principles that are now liberating hundreds, if not thousands, of visually disabled people. Yeah, that's something that blows my mind when you describe the specific things that he's doing. As he manages to learn how to navigate uh, while being blind, he knows when women are passing by so he can doff his hat to them. He's able to find friends in a restaurant, in a crowded restaurant, in a specific table. And uh, there's just so many stories like that. But now, can you describe uh, his first trip to France when he's treated as baggage? And is this the same trip where he goes to Mount Vesuvius? Yes, it is indeed. Uh, I actually start, start, the, uh, start the book with, the, with the, the rather dramatic experience of that he was climbing Mount Vesuvius at a time when it was erupting. And uh, he went, you know, all the way up to the top of where it was erupting and got as close to the heat as possible um, and, uh, and literally uh, charged a walking stick by, by sticking it into, into, the, into the lava. Um, and it was, okay, this was actually where he, he coined his phrase, I see things, I, I see things better with my feet. <laughs> and that's what that's that was the that was the thing that he said because he would walk around and he he would he would apprise things by physically experiencing them um and so yeah so he he could feel he he could feel the experience uh, you know, he walked closer he walked so close to the heat that that you know, the, the 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 soles of his shoes were burning and uh you know, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to have that, that intense of an experience? And most people would simply be happy to see it from, you know, from afar to, to sightsee literally. And it just showed that he had, that he, he'd keyed into a different kind of travel, a different kind of experiencing, because it is true that what, you know, that what uh, the, those of us who see quite often do is we do engage what we call sightseeing. We already have a mental picture and what a place is like before we go there. And then we seek out those, those things that, that fulfill that mental picture. And so there's this little feedback loop. And he didn't have that. And I think that he really saw that, that it happened. But that was also, it was such a big deal for him to be the first blind person to climb a Mount Vesuvius that uh, it, was, it was a special report was being made to the king of, of Naples at the time. And, uh, and so that was his first, his first, first in a way, it was his first achievement. And it does seem to be that that was when the idea of, you know, he stopped being a hapless British tourist and when the legend of the blind traveler began. And when I say legend, he was so famous in his day that he was quite literally very often just referred to, not as James Holman, but simply the blind traveler. And I found many newspaper accounts that would be the celebrated blind traveler came through our town today. This happened, that happened. These people welcomed him. He was so well known 
that uh, they quite often, they didn't even have to use his name. And he was so well known that when he died, he had you know, a, a very long, uh, I think like a page and a half entry in the Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, so he was quite famous. And then it was fascinating to watch that entry shrink over multiple editions until uh, you know, the, the, the 20th century when it just disappeared altogether. And so I found that you know, not only was there this astonishing person that existed who was such a celebrity, and he, he quite literally traveled with, uh, with uh, uh, portraits of himself, engraved, engraved uh, printed out portraits, because he quite often was required uh, to uh, give people his autograph. So he would leave these little portraits of himself with his, with his writing scrawled on it. So he was, he was that well known of a person. And then to see that that had disappeared quite so much and that, you know, the innovation that he had created uh, didn't really, he was a trailblazer, but in many ways the trail didn't stay open. People really, you know, it, 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 it was one thing when the world was mysterious, but then, you know, but then when we began taming the world, when the Victorian era, you know, gave way to this complacency where there were steam liners, that sort of thing. And he was born in 1786. And, uh, you know, there was actually no indication except for, you know, once the taxi, there's no indication that he had ever even taken so much as a train. So the, um, um, so the entire new method of his traveling was exactly the way that it had been done for thousands of years. And, you know, but he died in 1857, uh, at which point there were trains, there were steamships, there were the transatlantic cable was being, was being laid down. So it became a very different world when he left, where there was much less of a sense of, of adventure. And people weren't interested in being, uh, you know, once again, awed by, by nature. We weren't already getting it. So he really became this, this forgotten figure. And it was fascinating because it was almost a race against time for me to find some historical records before uh, the story itself completely disappeared. When people would talk about the blind traveler coming in and periodicals, were there any similar facts that you saw that they seized on over and over again? The same few things that would always stick out to them about Holman that you noticed? Yes, they were. They were they were always amazed by how friendly a gentleman he was, um, and uh, how he instantly um, he instantly achieved affection, which was really really fascinating because literally in his years of traveling, I think that he had like some money stolen once, but there was no. And, at no point did he have any bad thing happen to him. And it seems to be that he, he immediately gave the signs of respect to people. The first thing he learned, even before he learned a word of, of language, was that he, that he respected them. And that example of uh, in Equatorial Guinea, when he went to see the chieftain, you know, he, he simply took the hand of, of, an, of a native and let himself be led. This is the point where you know, the other, many of the other uh, British settlers wouldn't even physically touch this, uh, these people, much less become completely dependent upon them. So he would do that kind of gesture where he would, where he would, would show respect. Um, but the other most interesting thing is that he was also renowned for being a very good listener. And that's quite understandable because in many ways he was trying to understand the languages, but it was also interesting that he would, uh, um, he would always find something interesting about people themselves, even though he had this huge stock of stories. Uh, he never seems to have uh, paid for his supper and being entertaining. You would think that somebody who was wandering the world as a blind person would, would regale people with lots of stories. You know, I mean, we've got to remember that Homer, uh, was originally a, a, a traveling blind uh, you know, troubadour-like character, but uh, he doesn't seem to have done that. So he did, in fact, immediately achieve rapport with people. But then the most amazing thing, and this happened again and again, is that people would he would uh, people would become attached to him, and he would very elegantly 
detach himself from them. <laughs> the number of people who wanted him to, to you know, want to care of him, wanted to help him, would be their honor if they could, if they could take him around their, their city, their country, whatever. Um, that happened again and again and again. And he had a very gentle way of simply reasserting that he's just going to be alone. He's going to do it by himself. And we have a case where he is uh, uh, in a Central European country, and uh, and uh, when the great poets of the of the country comes and talks with him, and uh, he accepts the honors, of, you know, the idea of him being oriented to you know come come see the sights, this sort of thing. Uh, he smiles at that, and he says, "You know, all I really want is just stand me in the middle of the of the town." and point me in four different directions and describe what is there. And the person who writes this account does that. And he's happy. He, he's now worried that he knows, he knows you know, the, the lay of the land, and then he goes his own way. He goes alone. So this is quite an amazing thing to so quickly establish rapport with people and then so gracefully disconnect that rapport to the point that people and not only accepted him, but no longer pitied him, was a pretty amazing thing to do. And I think you mentioned that that's how he's able to have such vivid descriptions in his travel accounts, because he is good at striking up conversation with fellow travelers, getting their account of what's happening, and then recording it. And again, finding finding a way when others would probably give up. One story I'd love to hear, and... <laughs> There, there are so many stories about his life. If people are interested, I think they'll just have to get the book because, I mean, do you talk about his trips to the South America in villages there or South Africa or uncharted Australia? But one I would love to hear is his attempt to circumnavigate the globe, not by going west by ship, as most people would do, but going east instead. And as you mentioned, this is at the final stage of human civilization before railroads and steamship make the globe accessible. And he has to find a much more rickety, painful way to cross this landmass with a bone-crushing solution that's probably pretty uncomfortable for a guy with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So, could you talk about his Russia adventure? <laughs> yeah, he. Uh, first of all, um, and this is the other thing that we have to understand is that he did not, you know, pull off this this trip. And you know, because w- when we last left him. He had stopped going to medical school and had gone to Europe for his health and then kind of kept going. Well, it didn't quite work that, that specifically. He, uh, uh, he wasn't cheered on. There were points where, um, where he was physically brought back that people, people intervened you know, before he, he got his act together, before he mastered the skill of telling people to go away. Um, people intervened and, uh, and didn't want him to, to leave. And so, not only that, but let's remember the fact that, you know, he's a naval out of Windsor, so his job is, in fact, to to be saying prayers at the daily services twice a day for the rest of his life. He's not doing that when he's at the top of Mount Vesuvius. So, so there were some crowns, and, uh, and what happened is that he went back to Windsor Castle and tried to settle down for a little bit, but once again, he was very, very restless. Uh, but he wasn't allowed to go, you know, to go take off in, in your standard position. So what he did is he asked if he could go visit a friend in in Russia, in St. Petersburg, and nobody expected it to, uh, you know, that it, it was quite patently not the beginning of a vast trip because, you know, Russia was 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 wilderness on that, but it was Siberian wilderness. Uh, and there were no roads through the through through the most of the country. In fact, at that particular time, there was no road between St. Petersburg and Moscow. Uh, the remains of a road had been torn up in the in the Napoleonic War. So it seemed like a very safe thing to allow him to to do. Well, he went to Russia and pretty much just made a beeline and went across to Siberia. Uh, went through Siberia, um, taking very very rickety. Uh, um, forms of, of local uh, travel, uh, horse-drawn carriages and the sort. And, 
And I think um, as driver, they didn't speak a common language uh, as he's going all the yeah. way through. 